Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Petros Manasi, a senior director of Kaplan's pre-health programs. His expertise lies in building out MCAT plans and the medical school admissions process, along with guiding students on how to maximize what they learn in courses. Let's give a warm NPHC welcome to, Dr. to Mr. Petros. Hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully everybody's having a good day so far. I caught the tail end of, uh, of, the, of the research uh, research presentations. That was exciting uh, to see and uh, looking forward to really spending the next, we're going to say 50 minutes or so talking about the MCAT, although we can't cover everything about the MCAT in 50 minutes. We're going to cover as much as we can. And I wanted to uh, thank uh, this organization, the National Pre-Health Conference, uh, for having us and uh, being great, uh, great, great hosts and uh, really hoping that we got all your questions answered as best as we can. Um, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, this is a session obviously designed for you to get your questions answered. Uh, so, you know, kind of as I go through this, uh, you know, if you've got questions, got thoughts, we're gonna have a nice little QA time at the end, right? That's the that's the plan. So we'll uh, make sure we get as much as we can answered uh, throughout, that, throughout that process. So uh, is it okay for me to start sharing my screen? Yeah, and, go right ahead. All right, so let's... Uh, Let's do this and um, make this make this happen. Uh, so give me one second while I make sure I pull up the right PowerPoint because there may be uh, there may be a few uh, that are that are showing up and that did not work. So hold on. Let's try that one more time. There we go. Everybody should see something that says debunking the myths of the MCAT on there. So we'll start with the fun stuff. And the fun stuff is free stuff. So um, there's a QR code that's here on the screen. Uh, you can grab that. We're actually giving away a uh, one MCAT course scholarship to uh, to a lucky winner. So uh, go ahead and, um, you know, log into that QR code. Uh, you can do that anytime today. Uh, but I encourage you to do that ASAP because we're going to uh, be drawing that uh, at the end of your conference. So uh, the rules are listed in there. But more importantly, uh, you know, one of the things about the MCAT is uh, kind of getting started is the hard part. So we'll also be, uh, you'll get, get some information as far as all the free resources that we have available uh, to students. So I would encourage you to, to click on that and, uh, and take it from there. With that all being said, a little bit about myself. Um, as was mentioned, I've been with Kaplan for uh, a long time. Uh, I am here today as a teacher. So yes, I you know I, I hold a role at Kaplan that kind of you know runs the breadth as far as kind of what we do with our programs and how we develop our courses. I've been involved in all the different kind of facets of our program and development of our programs through the years. Uh, but I started as a teacher, and I still teach on our MCAT channel. So, you know, when you take a class with us, uh, I'll be one of your teachers, and uh, you can ask me all the questions that you want then as well. Uh, so I'm really here with my teacher hat, and uh, we're really here to kind of debunk some of these myths that exist about the MCAT and make sure that everybody is kind of thinking about this exam very correctly. And, you know, in my, in my years of experience, I can say that it's so often that students you know, we, we hear all these different kind of rumors and, and maybe you have heard some of these rumors. I'd love to hear if you've heard rumors about the MCAT where you hear your friends saying, oh, this is how I studied and I'm gonna study that way because my friend studied that way and she did well, so I wanna do well, so I'm going to do the same thing. And the reality is the advice that I give to every single student who's kind of starting this process is that we're all different and we're all gonna have different strengths, different weaknesses. We're all gonna have different needs as far as how we're going to prepare for this exam, but more importantly, how we're gonna be spending our time preparing for this exam. And I can tell you right now, that preparing for the MCAT is a major undertaking. I don't wanna scare you when I say that, but in reality, this is an exam that is going to be very different from what you've experienced before. And more importantly, it's going to require you to make sure that you're constantly analyzing your own performance and the work that you're doing because because it's such a different exam, which we'll kind of dive into here later on, uh, it's, it's very important to be thinking differently about this exam and making sure that you're truly harnessing your own energy and your own strengths against those opportunities uh, that are presented to you in the exam and how it fits into the overall admissions process as a whole. 
But I start with this question, and I always start with this question, and that is the question of why is it that you're here? Why is it that you're spending the you know the last the last day today tomorrow learning about all the things related to pre health related to preparing for the med school admissions process? And it's a very very simple answer, and the answer is because you want to be here, right? This is a white coat ceremony. This is what happens during the first week of medical school where students are oriented and welcomed into the medical profession. So the ultimate goal that you are working towards is not to get a high MCAT score. The ultimate goal isn't for you to get into medical school. The real ultimate goal for you is to be working and have the profession of working with patients, right? Of being a physician. That's why you're really here. And the reason I share this and I, and I want to emphasize this is that it's so easy. Maybe you've experienced this in the past. It's so easy to get discouraged when you've got the obstacles and you're taking the OCHEM class and maybe the reactions are a little bit, you know, tougher than you were hoping they would be. It's, you know, it's, it's so easy to get discouraged and kind of feel like, okay, when is this all going to come into play? So the advice I give to everybody is always remember that and remind yourself that this is where you are going to be. And this is the goal of where you want to end up. And this is why you are doing the work that you're ultimately doing. And, and you know, the rewards uh, will be there at the end, but it's a long path, right? It's a very, very long path. And it's a path that is going to take some dedication. And it's a path that is very, very doable. The good news is the MCAT is one part of the application process. It is also the most preparable part of the application process. It's actually, in fact, the most preparable of any entrance exam that exists for any you know, of the different uh, professional programs that one may be seeking. You've chosen medicine, so you're going to be taking the MCAT. And of course, it is a very preparable exam, which leads us to this first myth. And this first myth is this myth that the MCAT is the ultimate weed out of sticks. Anybody heard of this before? And I can see the chat. So you don't just want to yes in there, raise your hand, let us know, uh, you know let me know. Uh, if you've heard this before, right? You know that this that the MCAT is this is this weed out exam, and I'm you know going to it's make or break essentially. And and the reality is that it is an important exam, but because it is only one component, right? One component of the admissions process. It's a very important component, but it's only one component. So here's how the admissions process breaks down. And this is not a session today about the admissions process but I want you to understand how the MCAT fits into the overall picture that you're painting for the medical school admissions committees. Effectively, there are seven different factors that go into your application. There are seven different factors that schools will be evaluating you on. There's your MCAT score and your GPA, then there's your clinical experience, your volunteer experience, your research experience, the personal statement that you write, the letters of recommendations that others write about you. And then of course the interviews where the medical schools literally get to meet you, they get to put a face to the name, they get to know you as a person outside of all the pieces that have been submitted. And all these different components are what go into making the ultimate decision. However, the MCAT score and the GPA, these are classified as being the quantitative factors. So these are the numbers. And no medical school is going to purely admit a student based on the numbers. The GPA reflects how you performed in a very specific set of classes at your undergraduate institution. And as we know, every undergraduate institution is a little bit different, right? There's no like standard, everybody taking organic chemistry is going to learn these you know, definite things. Sometimes professors like to throw in maybe some of their research. Sometimes they emphasize certain topics and de-emphasize other topics. That's fine. You're learning, you're taking the classes, and you obviously want to do well on those because that shows what kind of student you are. The MCAT score, however, this is an exam that is standardized. It's the only part of the application that is standardized across all applicants. Everybody is being measured against the same standard, hence the term standardized exam. And as a result of that, it plays a very important role in the admissions process because the score tells medical schools what the applicant's potential is for success in med school. Because the MCAT has a very finite set of 
content topics that it that you are responsible for, but it tests you in a way that forces you to not just know the content. And if there's anything that you should be writing down for this screen, it's the following. It's not just about knowing the content. It's about knowing how to apply the content. And that's what the MCAT is truly testing you on at the end of the day. So medical schools are able to use that to see what kind of medical school student you're going to be. Now, again, it's not the only thing, but it's a very, very strong predictor of your success. And so they'll take that MCAT score, the GPA, and they'll, I don't want to say rank, but they'll get a sense of where you stand from a quantitative perspective. And essentially, your application will fall into one of three categories. There's the absolute deny, which essentially is the medical school saying, you know what, with the MCAT scores that we're seeing and the GPA we're seeing, we don't see this student being successful in our medical program. This doesn't mean you're not going to be successful in another one. It's just that school saying, you know, we know what it takes to survive our program. We don't think that this is going to work out. That's the absolutely deny. The presumably deny is, you know, pretty similar, right? It's we're guessing that this isn't going to work out, but we're going to take a look and see what else we see in the application. And then there's the presumably admit, where they say, okay, the numbers are good. Let's take a look and get to know the student outside of the numbers. What you'll notice, though, is there's no fourth category. There's no such thing as an absolute admit purely based on the numbers because they want to get to know you as a person. They want to see how you have spent your time outside of the classroom. They want to see how you have practiced your analytical skills in, a, you know, in, a, in research work. And research work doesn't have to be in a laboratory. It's just some type of analytical thinking. If they like those other factors and they like your MCAT score and they like your GPA, then they'll invite you in for an interview. They don't interview every applicant. In fact, most medical schools will interview about double the number of students that will ultimately be admitted. But what's shocking but not shocking is that when we survey medical school admissions officers, we do a survey every single year, year after year, when we ask the question, which of the following would you view as the most, admission, most important factor in the admissions process, the MCAT score comes back as number one. And you know we're about to deploy the survey again for this year. And my, my guess would be that that's when, that one's gonna come back as number one as well. And it all comes back to the fact that it is that standardized experience that they're ultimately evaluating you on at the end of the day. So yes, it's an important exam. No, it's not the weed out exam. But at the same time, it's one that you're going to want to dedicate considerable amount of time to as you're preparing for it, as you're getting ready for it. It's not an exam that you can like wake up in the morning one day and just go and take. You got you to gotta get ready for this. And however that getting ready is, is going to be up to you and what works right for you, right? This goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning, was this is a very personal type of experience where you have to find the thing that is going to ultimately work for you at the end of the day. But my advice to you is make sure that you're doing some type of preparation because it is so, so important. The other thing to keep in mind is we all have, you know, we all have stories. Uh, we all have situations that have happened to us through the years. What the MCAT score also gives you an opportunity to show is how you have grown as an individual, right? Maybe things didn't work out quite as well during your first year, the way that you thought that they would work out. And so the GPA reflects that. The MCAT score gives you the opportunity to show, look, here is how I've made my improvements. Here's how I've grown as a student. Now, as far as what is specifically tested on the MCAT, as I said earlier, it's very finite and it's publicly available information. There's no secret as far as what is required of you for the MCAT itself. What's tested on the MCAT is slightly different from what is required by medical schools as prerequisite courses. So every medical school is going to require a year of bio a year of general chemistry, a year of organic chemistry, and a year of physics, or the equivalent. Different schools have you know, different programs sometimes, which allows for you know, maybe it's two quarters of physics, and that you know, suffices as far as the requirements. So work with your advisors, and they'll be able to kind of help you out knowing which courses it is, and you want to make sure that you're taking. Those are required, right? And those are every medical school is going to want those. About two thirds of medical schools do require some kind of writing intensive course. There's about 20% of med schools that require calculus. Biochemistry is becoming a, a, a requirement. So more and more medical schools are requiring a bio, an upper division biochemistry course. But we really haven't seen it happen so much with psychology and sociology. But here's the weird thing. 
biochemistry, psychology, and sociology are topics that are included on the MCAT. So you now you have a situation where you've got content that's required on the MCAT, but you don't necessarily need to show the coursework as far as your GPA is concerned. At the same time, the content that you learn in that year of bio, the year of OCHEM, the year of physics, those, those prerequisite courses, not all of that is going to be tested on the MCAT. In fact, as I said, there's a very kind of finite level of material that is tested on the MCAT, and you're gonna probably learn more than what's required of the MCAT. Oftentimes we say the MCAT is a mile wide and an inch deep, meaning there are a lot of topics, but you don't necessarily need to go into them in as much depth as you may have gone into them in one of your undergraduate classes. There are myths out there that you've got to take genetics or you've got to take anatomy or you've got to take physiology, this kind of list that's over here on the right-hand side of the screen. All of these courses, none of them are required for the MCAT. None of them are required for admission to medical school. Taking these courses, though, will allow you to exercise the science portion of your brain. They'll allow you to exercise those critical thinking skills, those analytical skills. So they're not bad courses to take but you should only be taking them if they are truly of interest to you. And I'm not in any way suggesting that you take all of them. I had a, 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 an advisor friend of mine, uh, she was telling all of her students, you, you gotta take microbiology. It's like, well, microbiology isn't directly tested on the MCAT. The science that you need to know for microbiology or the analytical application of the science is helpful in developing that skill, but don't ever feel like you have to take a certain course. It's all about making sure that you're doing the work that you need to be doing and that you're developing those analytical critical, analytical and critical thinking skills as you move forward as far as the exam is concerned. The other thing to kind of couple as we kind of paint this picture of how you're going to be a successful test taker is to really think about the overall timeline for your MCAT preparation. So over on the left-hand side, that's the beginning of your MCAT prep. And really, if you think about it and you want to kind of think about this as a longitudinal process, at no point in time throughout your MCAT preparation will you be the same type of student, the same type of preparer. And here's what I mean by this. In the early days of your prep, the primary focus is going to need to be on content review, or let's be real, maybe learning some content that you've completely forgotten or you never learned or you never truly understand. So often when we're taking these classes, we're just like, I wanna get through this. I don't really know what it is, but I'm gonna be able to do well on the exam, right? So that kind of, those are the early days. And that targeted content review and really learning how the test is testing you, how the critical analysis is working, that's gonna be heavy up at the beginning, and it's going to slowly dwindle down as you go through your preparation because what you're going to want to be incorporating more and more of as you move through your prep is more and more targeted practice and more and more application of those critical analysis skills that you've been learning. So the idea is that you're always evolving. You're always changing. So don't get into the mindset of I'm just going to read a whole bunch of books about science, right? I'm going to read, read my, my textbooks and I'm going to learn all the content and I'll be fine on the MCAT because it's about the application. So you're going to need to make those kind of minor tweaks along the way. And it's actually quite surprising. And you'll, you'll experience this at, at, at some point when you do this, where students look back and they go, wow, I was doing so, so, you know, so many different activities in the early days and they think I need to go back to doing those. It's like, no, actually you're doing the right thing because in the early days you were a different in a different position, right? It's like training for a marathon or learning any skill. Early on, you're working on more kind of compulsory exercises and then you're able to add more and more and more and kind of grow yourself as that test taker as you go. And as I said, if you've got questions about any of this, please, you know, please, please let us know and uh, we'll be able to kind of answer these all at the, uh, at the end for sure. So one thing that I think is very important for everybody to kind of have um, you know, an understanding of is that, um, that, that, that finite set of content topics that are being tested on the MCAT. As I said, it's all available on the AMC website. It's all, there's no like secret to it or whatever. But that's how we build our courses. That's how we prepare our students. I, I've so often had 
conversations with students, and maybe I'll have this conversation with you one day, where students will say, Petros, you know what, I, I learned this thing in my OCAM class, and, and I don't see any of that in any of the Kaplan materials. You guys are missing something. And I go, we're not missing anything. That stuff's not tested on the MCAT, right? So we're not gonna, we're not gonna waste your time going through that material. So this really comes back to this notion of making sure that you have that kind of targeted, streamlined approach as you're working through this material, because that's just gonna make your life so much, so much happier uh, as you're going through this. Which leads us to the second myth, which is that the MCAT is primarily a science exam. And the reality is, yes, there is a lot of science on this, but how the MCAT is actually testing you is a combination of content and a very specific set of skills. So when we look at the science sections, you're being tested on scientific reasoning, on statistical skills, on being able to apply the science knowledge, you're being tested on experimental design, and implicitly, you're also being tested on just your expertise of the exam, knowing how is the exam gonna be asking questions, knowing how is the exam going to be structuring the answer choices, knowing where it is that I can extract information and where is it that I can kind of you know, hide information that I don't actually need, extraneous information that I don't actually need in order to be able to solve the problems. It's developing these skills coupled with developing your content knowledge and being able to put the two together that's going to lead you to higher and higher scores. And so when we think about the MCAT, really every question is at the intersection of a skill, a critical analysis or critical reasoning skill and content topics. And so being able to merge those two together is gonna to be very, very important, which is very different from how you have often been tested in your undergraduate classes. In undergraduate classes, we're oftentimes tested on whether or not we can recall the information and solve a problem. We're not necessarily tested on, okay, here's a completely new topic. How can you use the information that you already know in order to be able to solve the problem? And that's the skill that you're gonna to wanna to be developing along the way. And so this very naturally leads into this third myth that the MCAT is in fact testing you like your science professors have tested you. Now, if you haven't been paying attention for the last 22 minutes, I encourage you to pay attention right now because this is where it gets really, really interesting. The MCAT tests your content knowledge and tests the application of that content knowledge across content areas. And here's what I mean by this. These are the four sections of the MCAT. There's the chemical and physical foundations of biological systems. There's the biological and biochemical foundations of living systems. And there's the psychological, social, and biological foundations of behavior. So we hear the word biology a lot. It's in fact in all three of those sections. The fourth section, the critical analysis and reasoning skill section, also known as CARS, that one actually has no science on it. That is completely critical analysis. There is no science content knowledge that comes into play. But what gets even more interesting is if we break down the individual sections and the content that they are covering. So work with me on this one. The chemical and physical foundations of biological systems tests you, understandably, about general chemistry. It tests you on physics. So those we're like, okay, that's chemical and that's physical. Tests you on OCHEM, but it also tests you on biochemistry, which is oftentimes we think about it as a biological topic. And then you get to the biological and biochemical foundations of living systems and chemistry shows up in there again. Of course, biology is in there and biochemistry is in there. In fact, there's equal amounts of biochemistry in both of those two sections. And so here is where the MCAT is very different is that it's actually requiring you to integrate the natural sciences. And here's an example of what I mean by this. We think about the circulatory system. The circulatory system, we are first introduced to it in a bio class, right? It's a very natural place for it to be. We've got the heart, we've got some arteries, we've got some veins, we've got some capillaries, we've got the lungs, of course, that are gonna oxygenate the blood. It is a biological system very normal. You get to the MCAT and there's a passage that's about 
the circulatory system and you're like, okay, I got this it's circulatory system. I've, I've learned my information. And then you get to the questions and then you realize, well, wait a minute, I'm actually in the chemical and physical foundation section. And you get to the questions and all the questions are requiring you to use some physics formula. You kind of scratch your head and you wonder what, why is this? Is there something wrong with the test? And the answer is no. If you think about the circulatory system, not to trivialize it, but it really is nothing more than a pump, your heart, and a series of tubes. And those tubes are moving a fluid. And so you can all of a sudden be tested on fluid dynamics, on pressures, on cross-sectional areas, on the velocities that the fluid is traveling through different parts, if there are blockages in the system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not how you necessarily were taught about fluid dynamics in a physics class. But now all of a sudden, you're forced to think about a physics topic in a biological context. So part of your preparation, a big part of your preparation, is going to be about being able to apply those skills to multiple different places. Same thing goes with, the, with a topic like oxidation reduction. We see oxidation reduction in chemistry. We see it in physics. We see it in OCHEM, we see it in biochem. It's literally all over the place. We learn, relearn the same thing multiple times in different classes, but it's all the same. It's gain of electrons and loss of electrons. Again, not trivializing redox, but you have to be comfortable with seeing these topics in places that you haven't normally seen these topics. Here is, because we can't do a session about the MCAT without actually looking at a problem. So we're going to look at a problem here. And this is just to give you a sense of how the MCAT will test it. And I don't want you to look at this problem and try to find the answer. I'm going to walk you through kind of the anatomy. We're going to dissect this thing so we really understand the anatomy of how MCAT questions are structured. That's, that's the goal of this. So I want you to be very mindful of the analysis that we're looking at because you're going to see this over and over again throughout your preparation for this exam. So here it is. Question says, the sodium potassium pump is an ATPase that pumps three sodium out of the cell and two potassium into the cell for each ATP that's hydrolyzed. And we sit there, we go, okay, well, they didn't ask us a question. In fact, there's no question marks. So they definitely haven't asked us a question in that first sentence. More importantly, they have given us information that we probably already know, right? We know that the sodium potassium pump uses ATP because it's the most commonly used example for active transport in biology textbooks, plain and simple. And we learned that it's three sodium out and two potassium in, and we've seen this before. So they really haven't asked us anything. They've given us information that we already know, but if we'd forgotten that we knew that, that's okay. They've just given us that information, which means, and so here's how you think about this, and here's how you have to kind of analyze this. That means that they are never going to reward you for just knowing the three sodium and two potassium because they just gave you that information. They then give you some more information. They say the cells can use the pump to help maintain the cell volume. Now, you may have known that, you may not have known that, but either way, they just told you that information. So they're not going to reward you for that either. The question comes at the end. It says, which of the following would most likely happen to the rate of ATP consumption immediately after a cell is moved to a hypotonic environment? Now, all of a sudden, you need to scratch your head and say, well, what does a hypotonic environment mean? Hypotonic means hypo is low. So we have a low tenacity. So if we put the cell into a hypotonic environment, that means there's a higher concentration of water outside the cell than there is inside the cell lower concentration of solute outside the cell versus inside, the water is going to go down its concentration gradient, go into the cell, and the cell is going to start to swell up. As the cell is swelling up, we say, well, how can we maintain the volume? Sodium potassium pump comes into play. The sodium potassium pump, if it increases its activity, it will pump three sodium out of the cell, two potassium in, so there's a net movement of one ion out of the cell, which means we're increasing the tenacity on the outside of the cell. 
And we're going to get to a point eventually that leads, it, leads us to an isotonic state, right? The concentrations outside and inside are equal to each other. These are terms that we would want to become familiar with from a content perspective. We say, great, as it's increasing its activity, we would expect to see an increase in the ATP's consumption. Once we reach that equilibrium, then it could go back to normal, right? It, could, it can say, okay, I increased, I got us to equilibrium, I did my job, now I can quit and it's gonna decrease again. And if we think about that and we look at the answer choices, there is a very blatant answer choice, answer choice C that says exactly that. And if you selected that, sadly, you would get the question wrong, even though you have all of the science correct. And the reason why you'd get the question wrong, and maybe you're seeing this now, is actually pretty simple. It's one word. They didn't ask us what will eventually happen. They asked us what would immediately happen. So they have put a time frame onto the portion of the ATP activity, consumption of the ATP that they care about. And that is what is immediately happening. And immediately what's going to happen is it's going to increase. So this is, this is where you get rewarded, quite frankly, for being able to, why is my slide not moving forward? Uh, there we go. This is where you get rewarded for being able to identify very clearly the question that was truly being asked of you. So attention to detail also matters on the MCAT because I can assure you, I can assure you that the MCAT has put in answer choices that are incorrect for a reason, right? They, they assume that some students are going to miss the word immediately. The students that got the sodium and the potassium directions wrong may choose that it decreases, right? So every single wrong answer choice is a deliberate wrong answer choice on the MCAT. So you have to be very mindful of that and very cognizant of that as you're working through this. Which leads us to the fourth myth, which is this fact that you should be focusing on all the MCAT content equally. And I, I tell this story all the time, so I'm gonna tell this story to you. I had a student a couple of years ago. Um, the end result is she did very, very well on the MCAT, gone into med school, everything worked out just fine. But it was about two or three days before the MCAT, and I got a panic email from her saying, Petros, I've never learned alpha and beta decay. Can we meet and you go over alpha and beta decay so I can just learn this for, you know, before the exam? And clearly she had just done a practice test where she'd gotten a question wrong about alpha and beta decay. And my response to her was, we can meet for 30 minutes, we can meet for an hour if you want to, but we're not going to talk about alpha and beta decay because alpha and beta decay is a low yield topic on the MCAT. So this is where you have to also know how to play the game. There's certain topic areas that are higher yield on the MCAT, which means there are more points available, but there are more opportunities to get questions right in those areas. So this isn't about you studying everything evenly. We go out and we actually have identified the higher yield topics and kind of go through and mark those throughout our program. So it's like, okay, this is where you need to be focusing on. So that's important to make sure that you're placing the time in the right places. At the same time, it's also important for you to be very aware of your own abilities. And here's what I mean by this. If you're a rock star, we'll say thermodynamics, right? You're a rock star in thermodynamics and you are gonna get every single thermodynamics question correct. Yes, you should be doing some review occasionally about thermodynamics, but there are only so many points that you can get on the MCAT from thermodynamics questions. So if you wanna raise your score, you gotta force yourself to be working on the stuff that you're less comfortable with, which is the real takeaway here. Don't get overly comfortable because if you're comfortable, that means you're not actually improving your score, right? So if you're just doing questions that you know you're good at, you're gonna feel real good about yourself, but you're not gonna see as drastic improvements as far as your score, because that's not where the opportunities lie. The opportunities lie in getting questions correct that you previously were not getting correct. And the best way to improve that is to be doing practice and to be putting that laser focus on those areas. But at the same time, 
keeping an eye on what's higher yield versus what's lower yield, which goes back to what I kind of alluded to at the very beginning about making sure that you're doing what is right for you. There's this, um, you know, there's this notion out there that everybody needs kind of this one size fits all MCAT prep. And the answer to that is very, very much a no, right? We, you know, as an organization, we have a full range of materials available to students. I mean, from you know, the free materials, which you can get access to by that, using that QR code that I put up at the very beginning, uh, you know, up to like tutoring and, and all, all the things. Everybody's gonna need something a little bit different. And it's important for you to make sure that you are finding the material that is right for you and not at the same time just following what your friends necessarily did. My one of my big like beefs sometimes is when students say, well, my friend, you know, she read every single chapter of the Kaplan book and she did really well on the MCAT and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm like, well, that might work for you, but let's, let's actually figure out what's going to be the right way to go about it. Right. So we spent a lot of time helping students just figure out what the right path is. There's a lot of analysis that goes into it. So like in our programs, we literally are constantly evaluating your individual performance and making recommendations of what you need to be doing next. So like no two students are ever doing the same thing as each other as you go through. Which comes back to the last myth, um, which is that it's too early to start preparing for the MCAT. Oddly enough, you have started preparing for the MCAT from the first day you took a pre-med class because you started to learn the content that you were eventually going to be responsible for. The path to admissions and the path for your preparation for all the things is not a short path. In fact, if we look at kind of the overall admissions timeline, if you want to start med school in the fall of, let's use 2023, because that's kind of where we're looking at now. If you want to start in fall of 2023, that effectively means this coming January, at the latest, you'd want to be starting your MCAT prep so that you can take the MCAT in April or May, apply with your primary applications in June and July, fill out your secondary applications over the summer, start doing your interviews over the summer, start getting acceptances as early as December, January, or February of 2023 to start med school in the fall of 2023. The students that are taking the MCAT right now are taking the MCAT right now so they can apply for entry in fall of 2022. So, you know, this is the kind of just the general timeline for you. It's a long timeline. And generally speaking, we recommend students spend about four to five months studying for this exam. We recommend between 300 and 350 total hours. But as I said earlier, it's not about the hours. It's about the quality of the hours. It's about making sure that you're doing the work that you need to be doing as an individual and as you work through this. So, you know, as you think about kind of the MCAT, as you think about how this is all going to fit, you also need to be considering all the other pressures on your time. So that's another kind of area that we oftentimes overlook is we don't think about, well, I've got school, I've got work, I've got family commitments. So see how that all is going to play out. And the earlier you can start mapping this out, the better off you're going to be in the long run. So it's always better to be prepared early versus trying to do something at the last minute. So it's really kind of important for you to start adopting that mindset. For those of you that are you know, earlier on, if you're in first, second year, like you still have time, but it's never too early to really be thinking about kind of how all of this is going to fit. And we do have some pretty cool planners on our website as well that I would encourage you to take a look at as you're, as you're getting ready for, for, this, uh, for this big part. So with that said, we'll, we'll kind of wrap the, the formal part of this, um, although I hope this hasn't been overly formal. And uh, we can open it up to, uh, to questions that we have uh, and uh, see, what, um, see what everybody's thinking about and kind of take it from there. So I know what the best way is to do this. Uh, Angela, if you wanna tell me what to do, if we got the questions there, because I see a couple, um, you guide me. <laughs> yeah, um, why don't you start by unsharing your screen? We can go into gallery mode and then I can choose the questions that got the most likes. Um, 
by students. And then once again, if any student wants to raise their hand and actually ask the question, feel free to. So the first question we have is, in addition to the scholarship today, are there any other opportunities to receive a free or highly discounted Kaplan course? I've been wanting to sign up for an MCAT course with Kaplan, but I do not have the financial resources to sign up for a Kaplan prep I want. Great, yeah, that's uh, it's a great question. So I'll give you, I'll give you the, the two answers to that question. So yes, we're giving away a course today. Um, you know, there are other times where we will do course giveaways depending on you know, which school you're at or which clubs or organizations you're part of. However, um, you know, the story of Stanley Kaplan, and I, I apologize, you're going to get the long story about Stanley Kaplan. So Stanley Kaplan was a person. Uh, so Kaplan doesn't, I mean, Kaplan is a name. It's not, a, it's not an acronym for anything. Um, so Stanley Kaplan wanted to go to medical school uh, back in the 30s. And he was unfortunately denied admission to medical school because of quotas that were in place in the New York City area and New York State, so it was there were only, you know he he couldn't he couldn't go to med school because he was Jewish and there were only so many Jewish students that were allowed to go to medical school in any given year. Um, so sad, he didn't get to fulfill his dream. At the same time, though, he started to prepare students for this thing that was a new test at the time. It was called now we call it the SAT, and um, the reason why he did it was that he wanted to create more access to higher education at large uh, to as many students as he could, because at the time it was very much, the SAT was very much geared towards students that were kind of in the Northeast from certain uh, economic backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. So from the kind of beginning core of our mission and the core of our kind of the character of our organization, there's always been this character of uh, making our resources available to as many students as possible. So the reason I give you that preface is we actually have a tuition assistance program which grants up to 60% off of the tuition for our, for our courses. So yes, we have you know, like $100 off or 10% off every now and then that might show up on our website. But if you um, are, you know, if, if we don't want the financial component to be, you know, to be the kind of the, the factor that um, holds you back. So it's a very, very simple application. It's not very long. It's literally your name, an unofficial copy of your transcript, your estimated family contribution. And I think we asked you to write like a little paragraph about why you want to become, you know, insert, insert profession in this case, and why you want to become a doctor. Uh, and uh, that will grant up to 60% off of the tuition. So that is a, um, that is our tuition assistance program. We're very happy that we have that. We've had that for a number of years and, you know, make it available to students accordingly. That, that all being said, um, you know, depending on different clubs, I mean, everyone's from different universities, but, you know, different clubs or national organizations that you may be part of. Um, sometimes there are courses that are given out to those, but the tuition assistance program is, is the, that's like the big, the big deep discount. So whoever asked that question, hopefully that answers it for you and for anybody else who, um, you know, who might be, might be interested in that for sure. So literally Google Kaplan tuition assistance and it will, it will show up. That's wonderful. I'm glad everyone could hear that and hopefully take advantage of that. The next question we have is, what are some tips for studying for the MCAT while also taking courses during the semester? Yeah, that's a, it's a good one. You know, taking, so I think the general tip would be the following. If you can plan it accordingly, try to have a slightly reduced load during the term that you're also going to be studying for the MCAT, because that's, you know, if you think about your MCAT prep, it's going to require almost the equivalent amount of time dedication as a course would, like a science course would. So if you're able to, to dial back just a little bit, like maybe you take a, some non-lab-based classes in the term that you're studying for the MCAT, so it's less time consuming for you. If you're able to do that, that's a great kind of way to balance things out. I will say, try not to go too heavy up on your coursework and be studying for the MCAT because what we've seen happen and we see happen, unfortunately, when students don't ask this question ahead of time, uh, is that then everything gets compromised, right? The MCAT score gets compromised, the classes get compromised, right? All the things start to get compromised. And so we don't want 
we don't want that happening to you. So I think that's kind of the, the, the general statement there. On the flip side, if that's not an option, um, I would say as you're, you know, try to double dip. So as you're signing for the MCAT, there's something, is there something that you're going to be covering in the classes that you're taking that's also going to be on the MCAT? Study it once, but kill the, you know, kill the two birds with the one stone. It's horrible, horrible expression. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, you'll be able to, to be able to kind of uh, save yourself a little bit of time accordingly. Okay. Next question is, what is a good timeline for preparing for the MCAT in terms of how much time you need to spend on what? studying different subjects, doing problems, et cetera? Yep. Generally speaking, you're gonna to wanna to dedicate about five to six months longitudinally uh, for this prep. Um, and that means spreading it out, right? So you're not trying to do it all at once. Uh, you're definitely trying to spread it out over a longer period of time. One of the big skills that we, if you go to our website, you can actually find, we have some uh, different study calendars that are, that are available to you. So we have a six month, uh, I think a six month, a three month, a two month, and a one month study calendar, depending on where you fall as far as your start of your prep is concerned. But it really is about building out a calendar and incorporating the what that you're going to be doing when you're going to be do it, doing it. The mistake that I've seen lots of students make, and, and I do this too, so I'm like guilty of this as well, uh, and so tell me if you agree with this, where um, we just say, I'm going to study for six hours on Friday um, or six hours on Saturday. And then Saturday rolls around and you decide to sleep in a little bit. And then you decide to get lunch. And then you realize you got to do laundry. And in your mind, you're like, I'm just going to do studying for six hours tonight. And then it gets to nighttime and you say, oh, I'm going to go to sleep now. I'll just study tomorrow. We're really good at procrastinating. So the better you're able to put into your calendars what you're doing and how specific it is as far as you know what the what is uh, that you're going to be doing in those times uh, the better off you're going to be in the long run for sure all right sounds good another question would be when should we start preparing for the mcat if we would like to go to medical school right after undergrad so without a gap year yeah so great so if you want to do the like finish undergrad start med school route um then the ideal timeline is that you have taken the MCAT by April or May, really May of your junior year, right? So you take the MCAT by May of junior year. That way, when you apply um, in June, when the primary applications open up, your MCAT scores are available, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm careful with my words in saying, take the MCAT by May of your junior year. That doesn't mean you have to take it in May of your junior year. What it means is if you've finished your prereq courses for the MCAT and that's at the end of your sophomore year, you can study for the MCAT in your the summer between sophomore and junior year, take it in September, and then you're done with it. And if you need to retest, you can retest in January. Or if your fall semester or fall term in junior year is going to be a little bit lighter, study for the MCAT then, right? You don't have to take it in April or May. You just have to take it in an ideal world, take it by April or May. Now, if that's not going to work and you need to take the test after your junior year in the summer, you can still apply, right? That's, that, that's totally fine. You're a little bit further behind in the application process because med school admissions is, and I'm sure you'll cover this over the, you know, these days or you've seen this, it's a rolling process for most schools, right? So schools are, you know, reviewing applications as they come in, as opposed to saying, we're going to wait until the deadline and then review them at the end of the day. So that's the kind of the way to, the way to frame it in terms of the, the timeline. Now, if you want to take a gap year, then you just literally move everything by however many years you want it. So if you want to take a gap year, then you'd want to test in your senior year. If you want to take two gap years, then you can do it after you finish school. So it's just kind of up to you in terms of that. But we are seeing, I mean, people taking or students taking gap years continues to increase every single year. So we've seen more and more students taking gap years as they go. Awesome. Um, Caleb has a very specific question. Caleb is taking the MCAT in January and he says, I was studying for three months and felt like I was going in circles with the amount of content review. I'm beginning again, but focused on question-based learning. What is a happy medium? 
<laughs> what is the happy medium, right? So yeah, if you're, so Caleb, I think you, you did some good self-analysis um, in that if you found yourself going in circles with content review, that means you were doing too much content review and not enough actual practice of the applications. If you're only working on problems and you're not going back to content, then you, you're, you're missing out a part there. So the happy medium is the fault. Here's, I mean, literally like, here's how you do it. And here's what I tell every single student how to do it. You so you, you know, you obviously review the content and then you do some practice problems and you see what you got right. You see what you got wrong and the stuff that you got wrong, you go, okay, let me go back to the content that's related to the stuff that I got wrong. Let me make sure that I've kind of honed myself in on that. And then let me try that. You can even try the same problem again, right? Just making sure that you actually understand why it is that you made the mistake. That's going to be a big part of it as well. It's actually understanding the, uh, the reasoning behind your mistake and what caused you to make the mistake accordingly. So, you know, finding that balance is going to be important. There are going to be periods of time where you're gonna to need to be doing more content. There are gonna be periods of time where you are gonna need, need to be doing more uh, questions. But the most important thing is eventually there's gonna be a period of time where you need to start taking full length exams. Because I can assure you, it's a lot easier to get five MCAT questions right than it is to try to do a whole section than it is to try to do the whole test in a seven and a half hour period. So, you know, we didn't really talk about this here today, but I'll tell you now, you got to also build your stamina, right? So it's, you got to be performing just as well at the seven and a half hour mark as you were at the beginning of the test. So that will also come into your overall preparation plan as you move forward. Sounds like Caleb liked that response. If you have any more questions, Caleb, you can raise your hand and maybe get down a little bit more specific. Why don't we take one more question, and then I did notice in the question answer, someone didn't see that QR code in the beginning, so maybe we can reshow that once we finish yeah. answering that question. I'll, I'll do one better. I'll just share you the, the link so they don't have to, so I don't, yeah, so let's, let's do the question, and I can just share the link, and oh, that's exactly. the link for tuition assistance, which is awesome, but I'll get the link for the, for the, for the giveaway. Awesome. And it looks like someone raised their hand. So I'm going to allow them to talk and ask, ask their question. Right. Uh, Hi, I was just wondering, um, I was just wondering what's like the best way to study for like the car section. Is yeah, the cars, the cars section is all about, it's all about analyzing and learning how to analyze arguments. So the, 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 the better you can get at extracting the core reason why each paragraph was written in a passage, the better off, mm -hmm. the better and better you're going to get at it. So like, I mean, we spend hours and hours going through the car strategy um, in our programs because it's, it's a lot, but really at the core of it, that's what it is. It's like, can I, why did the author write this? Okay, she wrote it to convince me that, you know, this topic is true. And then she wrote the second paragraph in order to give me evidence. And the third paragraph, she you know, gave the alternative viewpoint. It doesn't matter what the alternative viewpoint is. It doesn't matter what the evidence is. It doesn't matter what she's trying to actually convince me of. What matters is the structure of the passage, for instance. And then within that, what are the arguments or how is it that she's making the arguments? Because the way the car section will then test you is they'll say something to the effect of, you know, the author states that X, Y, and Z is true, what is the flaw in her argument? And you're sitting there going, whoa, like where did, where did that come from, right? So you have, to be, you have to be on the lookout for understanding like how the actual analysis itself is going, is going through. So it's, um, that, that's really the kind of the beginnings of it. I will say even before that, the more comfortable you are reading passages that are written at you know a kind of more academic level the better off you're going to be so you know picking up something like the new yorker the new york times or the economist like those that that level of writing um will just hone you in uh to to kind of developing that that critical thinking um element of it so uh Thank you. And also one more like real quick question. So I'm also like interested in like 
going straight through the medical school. Um, and like I wanted to like take like the MCAT after like my sophomore year, and like the September of my junior year. Um, that's so you recommend like preparing throughout the summer, and also like if we had like other stuff, like should we like take it easy on like research or other activities we had planned that summer? Um, yeah, I mean that's what kind of was alluding to earlier. Like, it's all about finding the right balance. So if you you know heavy up on a whole bunch of commitments over the summer and you throw the MCAT in chances are it's not all going to work out, right? So you're not going to, yeah. something's going to have to give as far as the time commitment is concerned. We see this a lot where students who are testing, um, you know, who finish the prerequisites and decide to test between sophomore and junior years, where that is just the thing that you do that summer. Um, maybe you have one other activity, but that is your primary focus. Like you just, and so we actually have a program. It's our summer intensive program where students come in for six weeks straight through um, and the only thing that they're, I mean, the only thing they have, they'll have time to do is their uncapped preparation. So that's another option that's available to you as well. And I saw somebody posted the course scholarship uh, link. So great, we're, we're good to go on that as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Unfortunately, that is all the time we do have uh, for this session. So thank you so much for coming and spending the session with us um, and giving us so much information and resources and You're a welcome. scholarship. Um, ah. right, well, hopefully you all learn something and, and have a little fun doing it. And if you need anything, uh, feel free to reach out to us anytime.